Hey guys, and welcome to my Enchanter Guide, where I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know about the class of Enchanter. There are many Enchanters, and League is an extremely complex game, so I am going to do my best to generalize here for you. But I do think it'll be useful for you guys to have a fundamental conception of this class to build upon further. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. I want to start off by talking about Enchanters' general identity. So, Enchanters, they want to survive their early game, and they want to group up with their team in the mid to late, um, ARAM and teamfight front to back. Their power graph generally looks like a U shape. So really strong level one, and then there's a dip in the middle, you wig for the remainder of the early game, and then you start to pick up in the mid to late, you're really strong again. Their win con, this is generally surviving early game and using wave management and warding to ensure this. Being disciplined, being patient, and just doing the right things and trusting that that will lead to the best chance of win and to have your mythic item and to organize yourselves in a front to back fight and to team fight constantly. All right, let's move on to itemization for enchanters. You want to go spell thieves. This gives you that uh, mana regen, which scales much better into the mid to late game. And the scrappiness and chaotic nature of solo queue should allow you for a lot of opportunities to proc your spell thieves uh, easily. You also want to rush tier two boots to allow for the mobility post eight minutes when Herald is alive. And 9 out of 10 times, this should be Lucidity Boots, but you can consider uh, Boots of Swiftness in higher elo, like Diamond Plus, with champs like Soraka and Janna if you really want to roam around and match the roaming of your opponent. No Boots or Tier 1 Boots makes you practically stuck in bot lane, and you're unable to pressure other areas of the map at that crucial time period uh, of the 8 to 14 minutes mark and onwards. So typically, the strict 2v2 laning ends around level 5 and around 8 minutes. So this impacts your abilities order, your items, your runes, uh, and the other uh, points will be discussed shortly. Just keep that in mind. Your mythic is a very important power spike. It's one of the biggest power spikes for any class of support uh, for any item. Moonstone is typically the best decision for solo queue here, where fights are just generally chaotic and extended. This is where Moonstone thrives. Every division below Challenger, this becomes more apparent. Teams are less coordinated, less decisive, and fights are more extended. So on paper, extended fights is the best for Moonstone, and explosive fights are the best for Shirelias. It's up to you what decision you want to make with this info, that's just my take on it. I will mention that Renata struggles a little more than most other enchanters to proc Moonstone. Situational items, as always, after your mythic item. I'm going to list the situational items um, and the situations that each of these uh, helps in. So Putrefire. If there are two to three champs with significant healing in their kit, think about like Vlad or Aatrox or Soraka or Yumi or Silas, etc. Then you'd want to build this. For Arden Sensor, if there are two to three champs on your team that can benefit from on hit at attack speed. So typically um, one of them is going to be your attack speed slash your crit building uh, ADC and others are going to come from the top slash jungle position. You can think of champs like Viego, Camille, Jax, Kindred. These are just some of the first that come to mind. I want to put a special emphasis on pairing this with Aerie though, as this provides a readily available shield for champs like Lulu, Renata, and Zillion, who can struggle uh, to proc the, the Ardent, because you need to heal or shield in order to proc it. All right, Staff of Flowing Water. This is when you have two to three champs that benefit from the AP. Um, for example, you have an AP mid and jungle, or even you have an ADC who has decent AP ratios, maybe like a Kaisa or an Ezreal. It is very inconsistent uh, in solo queue to use the ability haste element. It requires you to use your uh, utility spells before your allies um, so that you can apply the ability haste to them and they get the full reduction. And this typically either means that you don't use your spell at the perfect time, or you miss out on applying the ability haste before the ally casts and their abilities go on the full cooldown. So for this item, I would prefer if you were focused on the AP version of it. Okay, so for Mikhail's, either a stunning ult where your carries don't have cleanse. Think about Lissandra, Ash, Sejuani, Varus, any champs like this. Or if there are two to three stuns that are uh, integral to a champion's kit. Here you can think about Zoe, Ari, Thresh, Fiddle, Galio, etc. So the main idea behind the situational items, if is if there are two to three reasons for you to build it, then that becomes an important situation for you to build it. So if there aren't any of these situations that are presenting itself, then redemption. This is the filler item 
with none of the above, okay? And then I will mention lastly, Zonyas and Magis. These are like the remaining filler items when you're really just looking to cap out your full build, which hopefully doesn't happen too often. All right, moving on to abilities. What you generally want to do is put three points in your laning ability and then max scaling. So for this, you could picture Soraka, three points Q, max W. Karma, three points Q, max E. Um, Renata, three points E, max W. Lulu, three points E, max W, etc. And this is because after level five and especially before level seven, the isolated 2v2 laning phase should be all but over and you don't want to over index into laning if you're not laning anymore. You really want to start indexing into those team fights and that mid to late game scaling. So the exceptions are if the enchanter does not have a strong lane trading ability and their whole identity is just to scale and to sack lane. You can think of champions such as Sona, Janna, potentially Yumi, um, Guardian, Zillion. This can also be subject to game state as well. If the game state is in an extended laning phase, then you want to index more into your laning ability. If the game or your lane blows up really fast, then you can index faster into your scaling ability. Just have an appreciation for the different situations that your laning and your scaling abilities would thrive in. Okay, moving on to runes now. Typically, this is going to be Airy or Guardian. It's also typically um, Airy versus Enchanters and Guardian versus All In lanes. But the takeaway from this, think about how you expect the lane to play out and if you need Guardian to survive or if you can greed Airy for the scaling and the utility. If you do go Airy, Resolve or Inspiration Secondary. Resolve can be good um, if you can get good value out of Bone Plating and Revitalize. So Bone Plating if you have Burst Lanes, Burst Champs, and Revitalize if you have significant healing and shielding in your kit. And if not, then Inspiration will be the next best option. If you do go Inspiration, you want to avoid Magical Boots, okay? Please, <laughs> really emphasize having that mobility uh, post level 5, post 8 minutes. Um, but take Cosmic 10 out of 10 times for the utility uptime as the game goes on. And you can pair this with one of three runes, either Biscuits, Stopwatch, or Futures Market, whichever you think will give you more value. Uh, biscuits, this gives you more mana if you're mana hungry. Stopwatch to dodge important cooldowns if you think about like Pike, uh, Karthus, Nord Alt, etc. And then Futures Market just as a filler if none of the above. Finishing up with the Airy tree, um, you want to go Airy and then typically it's going to be mana flow, very few exceptions there. And then it's also typically going to be Transcendence with very few exceptions. You can consider Absolute uh, on Karma if you really want to dominate lane paired with Scorch. But typically Transcendence and then you're going to decide between Scorch and Gathering. Once again, ask yourself, what am I planning to do? Am I trying to win lane? Am I trying to scale? If you're trying to scale, you're going to go Gathering. If you're trying to win lane, you're going to go Scorch. So if you're playing the Nami, the Soraka, the Karma, then you'd want to pair that with Scorch to really dominate lane. And if you're going to play the scaling, the Sona, etc., you're going to go Gathering Storm. If you go Guardian, you want to either go Mana Flow and Transcendence or Cosmic and that plus one situation we were just discussing. I personally prefer Mana Flow and Transcendence as both runes really help out for the scaling and utility at the moment. The main exceptions here, though, are Glacial Jhana and Electrocute Nami, the most common exceptions. I'm probably forgetting others, but try to appreciate the general enchanter overview here. In terms of what you're looking for in the Guardian uh, and the Resolve tree, you'd want Guardian, you'd want typically Font of Life if your teammates can actually proc it, and then you want to stay away from conditioning and second wind typically, as an enchanter's weakness is just getting blown up and they typically don't build any type of resistances, so you don't scale the conditioning at all. You really want to just survive with bone plating. And then it's typically revitalized, although if you really feel like you need to make an exception for unflinching, if it's especially hard to survive versus them and they have a lot of CC. Although for the most part, if you have some kind of healing or shielding, you want to back it up with revitalize. Okay, so for shards now, this is a bit harder to generalize. If you want to take the scaling approach, you would want ability haste, AP, and armor. So this might be in a really tough lane, or maybe you're playing Sona, or Lulu, Yumi maybe, things like that. And if you have lane presence, so you can think more of like Karma, Nami, and Soraka, then you want double AP uh, and armor to back it up. So that double AP will really give you those solid trades to help your early game, which is a lot of your strength. If you have synergy with attack speed and you expect to be able to auto attack as well in lane, then you want to go attack speed and AP 
and Armour. So here you can think about Lulu uh, and Renata. Of course, if you are versus AP bot lanes, you can swap out the Armour for the Magic Resist at the bottom. We're going to talk about the early game now. And the early game versus Enchanters and Engagers, as an Enchanter, can be quite different. So what I'm going to do is start with the general laning strategies. What you want to do is to have high uptime for the first two waves. Auto attack minions constantly. Generate and maintain a minion HP advantage so that your enemy has to deal with the minions instead of having an even playing field trading ground. Avoid sitting in or contesting bushes. This is generally a loss in maintaining that minion HP advantage. And if you are looking for autos, being in a bush achieves absolutely nothing. Try to hit level 2 as well and use that spike confidently to win the early lane. How you want to generally trade is to trade with autos backed up by spells. So just naked auto trades are bad. Your HP and your AD is not your strong suit. So if you are looking for naked auto trades with the enemy ADC, it's not gonna go too well. Also, look to poke enemies when you have a minion HP advantage or a cooldown discrepancy. That way you can be more confident to win the trade, or if the enemy doesn't have their cooldowns, you can confidently step up and find an advantageous trade. The final point for the general laning is to use the jungler's proximity to fix the wave when necessary, and to be mentally prepared to ping ganks off if necessary, as you have low setup, and you may have a bad wave state for a gank, but you could still use the hover for him to allow you to crash a wave. Okay. Moving on to an Enchanter vs Enchanter. This becomes an all-out war of attrition. Keep your foot on the gas almost permanently in terms of vying for that minion HP advantage. Constantly auto-attack minions. And trade when they have cooldowns down or you have minion HP advantage. The most common mistake I see here is uh, my students do not keep the foot on the gas after they have crashed a wave. So they would crash a wave, the next wave would come into the lane, and then they would be missing out on opportunities to start damaging that wave before your wave meets their wave. So really keep your foot on the gas and try to figure out how you can damage minions constantly. There is almost no counterplay to the permanent war of attrition as an enchanter versus an enchanter. You may find a window here or there to stack a wave and then crash a stacked wave and try to zone the enemy out, but mostly really try and get this feeling for the permanent war of attrition and feel out how useful and oppressive it can be. If you ever give them a window to base and heal back up, and come back to lane to catch this stacked wave, you have missed a massive opportunity to generate a lead. So I want you to visualize this quickly. You're permanently shoving, poking, pressuring, and then you're poking them out, they get really low, they base, and you just continue to permanently shove. They're going to miss an entire wave there, coming back to lane. But if you try to slow it down, and crash a stacked wave that gives them time to come back to the lane and catch that stacked wave. What the permanent war of attrition does is it allows you to get this slow bleed, slow burn type of playstyle. Slowly but surely you will accrue a minion lead, you will accrue a poke lead, a tower plates lead, pressure lead, everything is just going to slowly start to overwhelm the enemy. And so since enchanters typically have low gang setup, if you ward around your lane, this is why you can almost permanently safely shove. The enemy enchanter can't set up the gank. You'll have windows to ward deep for enemy ganks, and you want to draw the enemy jungler to your lane. You want him to waste time trying to gank you and failing, and not pressuring other lanes, not farming. This is how you want junglers to interact with your lane. And the same goes for your jungler. You don't necessarily want your jungler to gank your lane. You want him to use your pressure to potentially counter jungle or to potentially stack dragons or for his proximity to just be able to shove a wave and base when you need to. From this uh, dissuading the ganks by the jungler and drawing his attention, you want to position more towards the center of the lane or towards spot river to be able to dissuade gank attempts and stay away from the bushes. You don't want to expose your ADC to the ganks. Your ADC is very important. He typically has very few tools to deal with the gank as well. You want to either make the jungler decide between ganking you and then your ADC can stay alive and not miss any minions or uh, try to go through your your spells, you know, like your Zoraka Q, your Karma Q, your utility 
uh, which would make it hard for him to kill your ADC. And on this point, again, waste the jungler's time and attention. Don't give the gank undue respect. You don't have to just immediately back off if he shows on a deep ward. You can pretend like you haven't seen him. You can still pressure the lane a lot. And the ganks, you can potentially get out in a 2v3 situation. So waste his time. Waste his attention. And if you don't think that there is enough of a threat on you, then just don't, just pretend like you haven't seen him at all. Maybe you've poked out the enemy lane a lot. They have very low setup. The jungler doesn't have much threat, and so you just continue to dominate 2v2. And so what you might have noticed in this um, laning gameplay in the background is that I used my ward in the river after the second wave. And so here's the second wave. I used my level 2 spike. I got some poke. And then after this wave, I'm going to go and ward the river over here to not only see the jungler entering from this side, but also if he potentially wraps around this way, we can see him. And then whenever you have opportunities for the rest of the laning phase, use your vision selfishly to set up your 2v2 permanent war of attrition domination. Okay, Ping for your lane in river. Ward around your lane and around uh, or over the dragon pit to provide safety for your lane. Put a little bit less emphasis on warding around mid, around pixel bush, around raptors. And also, this is the final point, use your lead bot to translate to Herald in the 8 to 14 minutes mark when your jungler is pressuring top river. So this is what you're going to see here. My jungler is active on top river, I have shoved the wave in and then I'm going to meet him on top river. There's no point running to Herald if your jungler is not active on top river. If he is farming blue side camps, there's no point in doing this. Even if he's farming red side camps, there's no point in doing this. He's not active on the map. A lot of times what I see is that I ask my students to do this and then my um, the jungler is doing red camps and then they move up here, he's not ready to pressure top river, then they move back down bot and now after he's cleared his red side camps he's active on the river and he's active and now we're bot and we've just missed that window. So when your jungler is active on top river, meet him there, facilitate herald. And this is low risk because when you are verse enchanters, they can't dive. Like my Jin is going to be quite safe, even though Lucianami has a lot of damage. Um, typically there will be a little bit less threat for dives from enchanter lanes. The most that my Jin would probably lose, theoretically probably like three melee minions, he can play a little bit respectfully and then I'm going to look to come back as soon as possible. So I just want to have a quick look at what all of this means. I'm going to be hanging around Herald and I want to look for an opportunity to move back towards bot if they don't contest Herald because I don't want to hang around longer than I have to, but then I notice that there is some activity going on in this Herald fight, and so we have numbers advantage, right? This is where I want to be. Nami is just stuck bot, and so theoretically we should win this fight. We just misplayed it a little bit, slash a lot. It happens. My sin is just kind of stuck top, but this is where you want to be. This is how you're going to maximize getting your Herald, blowing up a tower somewhere and your bot lane is still perfectly fine. Okay, I want to talk about enchanters versus engagers now. And the game that I'm going to be playing in the background, I feel like would really emphasize the points that I want to make here. We are double enchanter versus double threat uh, melee champs and we're getting weak sided so it's all about minimizing and scaling up. So let's see how we are able to do that. First point, you want to look to poke them, these engagers, these shorter ranges, uh, whenever it is safe to do so. And this is especially easy on the relic procs when they are going to move forwards away from fog into the minion wave so that you can poke them. Also, confidently trade when their cooldowns are down. Extended trades are good for you with your range advantage and shorter cooldowns. So if they put their engage spells on cooldown or they fail to one-shot you, you can take that extended trade. The main point here is to look to freeze look to freeze the wave on your side of the lane to avoid orlins and to avoid ganks. It's very hard to be ganked when you're right by the safety of your turret and it's very hard to get orlin if you're right by the safety of your turret. So this is your zone in which you can safely scale up to the mid to late. The next point is about vision. As you're not perma shoving, you don't need these selfish wards for your lane like you do in the enchanter versus enchanter matchup. So you want to spend more time and more resources in helping mid. 
vision in the Raptors area and Pixel Bush and just around mid is where you want your wards to go. And mid is the lane in where you want your pressure to be generated while you minimize and avoid bot, um, while ideally holding a bot wave freeze. And so these are the tools that are going to help you to scale in the mid to late. Hold a freeze, stay healthy and disciplined, apply pressure towards your mid lane so that you actually can answer the enemy's pressures through bot. And that's just how you're gonna play out the early game versus engagers. I'm gonna just play a little bit more footage to show you what this looks like. So I'm not going to be playing that perma war of attrition like you would have noticed in the other example. I'm letting them shove it into us and I am posturing to hold the freeze where we cannot get all in and we can safely scale up. Whenever their cooldowns are used, then I feel confident to walk up and look for these trades. And again, I am confident to trade by the safety of my tower when they are looking to move forwards to CS. Here, the wave is going to be stacking and pushing away from us. So, one of two things needs to happen here. Either Zin, uh, we use Zin, uh, Zin's proximity to help crash the stacked wave, or they naturally break it for us, uh, which is what happens. And so we're perfectly content with this game pace. I'm playing very disciplined. Once again, I'm posturing forwards to hold that freeze. And I'm using my disengage spell to dissuade their engage. Since there's a Yasuo and our Zin is around here and they're quite low with no cooldowns, this is a window where we do uh, find a gank, although my main priority is to ensure that my jungler's proximity leaves us with a good wave state. So I'm pinging him to come and shove here. And then we can have a good wave state and then Zin can go and pressure the rest of the map. What you really want to avoid is your jungler having been bot side and then he leaves and your wave state is bad. You can't crash the wave. It gets frozen out here and your jungler naturally wants to put his camps on cooldown. So he wants it part of the way and if you have a bad wave state at that stage then it's just really doomed. So I ensure it crashes and then I'm happy. I'm going to be applying some pressure towards the middle of the map as I don't want to be bot right now. There's no pressure to be gained through there. So more emphasis on this mid vision and pressure and control. I'm even going to clear a pink for mid. We get Ari's flash, we chunk her out. Meanwhile, I am happy with where the bot wave is. So once again, I'm going to posture to uh, prevent the crash, but there's just too many minions. So we're going to go back to scaling not hitting the minions, allowing them to just shove it into us. If they let this push into them, then eventually we would stack a big wave and look to crash that with a lot of auto attacks while I save my Q for their engage. Or we can once again wait for our jungler to be on our side of the map and help him to fix it. This is going to happen a lot though, where people just brain dead shove waves. So we're more than happy to safely collect it. They have no all in threat right by our tower. So if this was out here, we would be dead. They can't commit to a fight like that here. And then Wukong tries to offer his help in this futile attempt at killing us, but we're right by our tower. They can't follow up. So the enemy jungler, he really wanted to play around this winning bot lane and punish the double enchanters, but their wave management wasn't good enough and we were able to stay healthy enough and minimize. Speed it up just a little bit more. A lot of the same stuff here in terms of not hitting the wave. I want to posture to threaten the freeze and this is just a, a possible bait option because I know that my Zen is coming and that he doesn't have flash and he's a melee unit, uh, a melee champion. Once again, I am ensuring that we crash this wave using his proximity. And so we take stock of what everything has happened. They only have one bot plate. We're going to get one or two here. They haven't snowballed whatsoever, and we're going to outscale them drastically as the game goes on. Okay, so the mid laner comes and cleans some of us up. 
bit unfortunate. I just want to show one more example. I'm going to use my move to play through my pressuring lane from base, potentially find a, a Q or a fight around here, as I know that the wave is still here. And if they try to hold a freeze, then the next wave I can potentially move down and try to break the freeze. Right now, this is where I want to be. And I'm trying to keep my eye on what's happening bot. Once again, they're not freezing. So I either allow my Sona to catch the wave, or if I deem there is enough dive threat, I need to pass towards her and prevent the dive. That's what I decide because they do have quite a lot of dive threat. Cool, and that's versus engagers in a nutshell. All right, moving on to the mid to late game, and I really don't want to spend too much time on this section. I heavily encourage you guys to check out my mid to late game guide that I recently came out with. It really summarizes this very well and will apply to enchanters. I'll just quickly summarize the mid to late game. You want to play through mid, so mid first. You look to shove mid waves, you look toward mid, and then you translate that pressure from mid to the rest of the map and to potentially control a quadrant towards a side, towards an objective, things like that. In terms of enchanters, I want to emphasize how you're less flexible to roam around and you really need to be passive and patient while your jungler is not pressuring the map. It's very hard for you to control vision, to face check, to roam around by yourself. And so when your jungler is pressuring the map, you want to pressure with them. And that's the third point in my mid to late game guide in terms of pressuring with your jungler. I just want to stress being comfortable when your team is low pressure. And if your jungler is not pressuring the map, then you have to embrace reality and concede the map until your jungler is ready to pressure the map once again. And your strength comes with numbers when you are grouped with your teammates. The next point, and I see this more and more in my students' uh, replays, is to embrace reality. Mid first is really important and it is the best play, but if your team isn't mid, and especially if your ADC is not mid, it is better to embrace reality and just group with your team. As long as you know that mid is the most optimal way to pressure the map in the mid to late game, and then you communicate that to your team, you need to embrace reality after that for the full ace mentality and group with your team. There's no point in leaving your immobile ADC by uh, themselves in the side lane when they are very susceptible to getting killed. You would want to try and allow him to shove and eventually bring him towards mid. So that's the mid first. In terms of vision, one mid, two quadrant rule. Drop a ward in the mid lane, drop two wards in a quadrant that you want to control. It depends on what you can control in terms of the game state, in terms of objectives coming up, how much pressure your team has, things like that. Okay, so I wanted to show a quick example of how you want to play the mid to late game with an enchanter. I'm going to do something a little bit different here, and I want you to just pay attention to the minimap and have a look at what mid first and pressuring with your jungler could look like. Playing a lot around mid, whenever my jungler is active on the map, I'm trying to meet him. Mid first, active pressuring with jungler. Back towards mid. Pressuring towards jungler. Never straying too far away from mid. Jungler is not pressuring the map, I'm gonna base. Through mid once again, meeting up with my jungler. Through mid, meet up with jungler. Find a base. Mid first, yet again, waiting for my jungler to start pressuring the map and then I'm going to meet him. And you can see this example about <laughs> like 10 to 20 times this game. Always mid first, always pressuring with jungler. And this, is a, this was a very macro oriented solo key game. There were not a lot of fights, so I thought this would be a great example to show what the mid to late game macro should look like. And you can replace Renata with any other enchanter and you would be wanting to make the exact same decisions here. We'll just watch a little bit more and then we're going to move on to some teamfight examples. But once again, through mid, looking to pressure the map with the jungler here. And if your solo queue junglers pressure a lot less than this, that, that doesn't matter. You just have to wait until they pressure the map for you to confidently pressure the map with them. All right, moving on to teamfights. This is your strength as an enchanter. You flourish in these because you have incredible utility the longer the fights go on. As long as you remain in a front-to-back formation, so there's an ally front line between yourself and enemies, fights can go on indefinitely. And so you need to position selfishly to ensure this. Sometimes this means shying away 
from a chaotic river fight or a skirmish or something that might expose your flanks and regrouping behind your front line. So we saw a bit of this going on around here. I can no longer safely rejoin my team through here, so I am going to make sure I go the long way around and maintain that front to back position. So when you're versus engagers, the onus of proactivity is on them. Save your disengage spells for them or for the fellow engage options is engage. And you can draw confidence from the frustration they feel the longer that the fight goes on. So once again, Enchanters is all about doing the right thing, staying disciplined and patient. You don't have to do anything special, just do the right things. So if you're versus Enchanters as well, nothing really changes here. You want to disengage their engage tools and you want to be more disciplined in your front to back and cooldown management than your opponent. We're going to have a look at a few fight examples in terms of ensuring that front to back and looking to make the most out of our cooldowns. So there's going to be a fight that breaks out over here. And this is just a fantastic front to back fight. I'm trying to get the most out of my queue. I'm not just kind of chilling way in the back, hoping my team carries. I am actively trying to do something with my kit. And the longer the fight goes on, the happier I am. Okay, let's look at a few more. So in this game, they have a lot of clear engaged tools in terms of Camille, Sejuani, Silas, Kaiser. And I really want to make sure that my Q and my alt are used reactively to counter their engage while being in the front to back. Let's see what that's going to look like. My Lucian is out of position. He gets engaged on. I bubble after the Camille alt lands and then I try to alt all of them. Buy some space. Ensure that I'm positioning so that I'm not in threat but I can still peel and provide in the front to back fight. I just want to especially point out a fight that's going to come up and how common it is in solo queue for the enemy team to just get bored get undisciplined and you do the right things and then things are going to work out for you so they're fighting really deep into our territory they try to jump on my adc i use my cooldowns well enough and they're just all going to die and so your enemies will feel like they're on a bit of a timer if they are versus an enchanter and they don't have one of their own Maybe they just get bored and they just want to kill and they don't really know how to win and snowball the game appropriately. So just emphasizing doing the right things, being disciplined, being patient, that's going to maximize your chances of winning. I'm sure this kind of situation does not look foreign to very many of you at all. Let's have a quick look at another fight from this game. My Lucian's jumping forwards. There's a TP coming onto this ward here. I'm going to time my bubble for the TP. Peeling my ADC, ensuring there's a front to back. Silas jumps in, I'm going to disengage, follow up with my ults, and continue in that front to back mode where we can just consistently outperform them. Okay, I want to quickly talk about a few common mistakes and misconceptions that enchanters experience. The major one in my eyes is not rushing tier two boots. This is tied into taking that magical footwear. You really do want to have that mobility to roam around as the game starts to progress. Another one is being stuck bot lane too long and not facilitating that herald versus enchanters, not opening up and pressuring through mid versus engagers. Also not pressuring lane, standing too far back and just autopiloting in the mid to late. And hopefully with this permanent war of attrition, you can really see what you can do. In a matchup that seems pretty boring and uninteresting, you can really take over the game with that permanent war of attrition as an example. Also not saving disengaged spells for an engage. You want to go into fights actively anticipating a cooldown that you are going to disengage. That way you don't have to have insane reaction times and keep 10 different things that are happening on your screen in mind at the same time. A bit of anticipation could go a long way. And, there's where, and this is where the patience is going to come into play as well. If you just picture an Orn uh, versus, let's say, a Braum, and Orn is never pressing R, and Braum is never pressing E, and Braum needs to be more comfortable that he's not using E, and all needs to be pressed to try and ult. Sometimes I've seen Brawns that just press E for something weird when Orn has been holding his ult and then they lose the mind game there. You can use this kind of logic for any major engaged tool. Let's say there's a Fiddlesticks and your Janna and you're using your Q and your ult frivolously when he hasn't entered the fight, then he's going to enter the fight after that. As long as you're patient, you have to have faith that um, the discipline and doing the right things is going to carry you over the finish line. The last point I want to mention is not putting thought into the summoner spell. Uh, obviously you want to take flash, but then for the secondary summoner spell, exhaust is to reduce burst damage. Uh, ignite is if you're expecting volatility in the bot lane. Heal 
is pretty good if you're looking to sec bot lane and scale up and group more so, and also if you're going to take Revitalize. But if you're not really sure, Exhaust is probably the best default, as roaming with heal is low impact. I want to give my thoughts on Enchanter as a whole class now, before we wrap it up. Uh, I think Enchanters are inherently broken for solo queue. Due to the nature of solo queue being extended, um, chaotic, uncoordinated fights where Enchanters can thrive, this is why you'll consistently see the top 5 to 10 support win rates for practically every patch globally being enchanters, okay? They are also fantastic for those who embrace structure and discipline. You've heard me throw the word discipline around a lot today. However, their win conditions, which is typically survive, you know, scale up, group with your team, don't make any proactive decisions. This leaves little room for improving and challenging yourself and little room for creativity and expressing new ideas. So you often miss out on exploring damage limits, making those game winning decisions and really pushing yourself to the next level as a player. So my overall um, synopsis would be that enchanters are very strong in the short term, but weak in the long term in terms of your approach and improvement. I just want to add to this quickly and say that these are my concerns if you are one tricking the class of enchanters. You can have a small but a diverse champ pool in terms of a few different classes. There is an argument to be made to both one trick a class to really master that style and to be able to diversify your classes to be able to fit comps and understand the game more holistically. Maybe you guys can share your thoughts on which one might be more suited to your improvement. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you can take something from this guide and apply it to your Enchanter gameplay and not to copy everything that was done in my explanations, but more so to just understand the concepts behind them. So as usual, for School of Support sessions and for educational support content, um, the link is going to be down below. For individual coaching and also for joining my Discord server, all of those links are going to be down below. I would love to see more faces around my Discord and my School of Support coaching sessions. So thanks again for watching. Goodbye.